Hey everybody, I'm Francesca Maxime, and thank you so much for joining us again for this edition of Rerooted here on the Be Here Now Network. Um, really honored to have a, a special creative arts guest, for lack of a better word, a professional musician, uh, Christian McBride, an American jazz bassist, composer, and arranger. He has appeared on more than 300 recordings as a sideman, is a six-time Grammy Award winner. No joke, you were just listening to uh, a song called Gang Gang, written by Warren Wolf on his uh, People Music album, I believe, and Christian's involved in so many things, and I just want to welcome him to Rerooted. Thank you for joining us, Christian. Francesca, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, my friend. <laughs> Christian McBride. So, you know, first of all, we talked about a year ago uh, on my Wise Girl podcast before it became uh, the Rerooted podcast here on the Be Here Now Network. And I am, yes. uh, you know, just so happy that we're talking more now also about these creative arts and, and uh, how they can help inspire us and cultivate joy uh, because a lot of the other parts of the podcast, a lot of the other episodes around like unpacking trauma and things like right, that. So, right, right. so in any case, that's why I'm, I'm really happy that you're here. And um, I want to start with what you were doing last night. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that kind of bridges the social justice piece and right. the racial awareness piece and the, you know, all of that with the um, creative piece. Well, as you know, my wife, Melissa Walker, and I run a nonprofit called Jazz House Kids, and uh, it, it uh, teaches kids through the media, medium of, of jazz, uh, the, uh, the democracy of jazz, uh, the, the uh, creativeness of jazz, uh, uh, the high level of expression through jazz. And so we see over um, a total of 1,000 kids throughout the school year uh, we're in schools around uh, the state of New Jersey. Uh, we're about to start branching out into New York very soon. Um, we have a summer camp that happens in August, which culminates in our Montclair Jazz Festival. But last night was our annual uh, gala event, and we had it at City Winery in New York. And um, the theme of the gala was uh, celebrating 1959. And uh, a lot of jazz critics and, and musicians as well have regarded as, has regarded 1959 as this sort of watershed year because if you, if you ask most musicians and most critics to name the 10 most important jazz albums of all time, probably half of that list would come from albums that were recorded in 1959. So there was just some magic spark that happened in that year. Miles Davis released Kind of Blue, Giant, uh, John Coltrane released Giant Steps. Uh, Charles Mingus released Mingus Our Um. Ornette Coleman released uh, The Shape of Jazz to Come. And Dave Brubeck uh, released Time Out. And so we invited a bunch of musicians to play selections from those albums last night. And uh, we, our, our concept is to always mix a handful of our students uh, to be able to play with the established uh, professionals. So it was a very, very wonderful night. A lot of people came out. Uh, I think we made a lot of money. I, I have to check with, with the misses later. Uh, so. But it, it seemed to be a really good night all around. It's beautiful. And you had NBC News anchor Lester Holt as the MC. is that right? That's right. And uh, we played a, a, a quick little bass duet because, you know, he's a bass player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I love it. And, and, and you know, it's... Um, I just love how music finds its way into so many people's lives. It's so much a part of, uh, even when people who are like, you know, uh, Lester, you know, as a, as a fellow journalist and um, Mr. Holt, perhaps I should say, uh, that, that it balances out the intensity sometimes of the work that one does when one has to be so attentive to. Um, well, that, that's exactly what he said when we were off stage last night. You know, I can't imagine what kind of uh, uh, stress and, you know, like being, I mean, well, you know about that, you know, being on live news, you know, uh, the sort of daily angst that you must get, you know, reading is teleprompters and you get like some sort of traumatic breaking news story uh, happens. And he said, you know, sometimes when I go home, I just got to pick up my base and, and, and transfer it to the, the other place, you know? Yes. And I love that transfer to the other place. I'm going to hold yeah. that as a placeholder and then we're going to yeah. come right back to that because I think that that's, um, that's really critical. Um, 
the part about jazz house kids, I mean, you're talking about kids in New Jersey who are of what age, what is their sort of background, their circumstance, mm-hmm. um, you know, what kind of kids are you, uh, is Jazz House Kids helping out with, with this kind of a gala? Well, he, here's the thing, like, when you talk about jazz and what that means, uh, I think our overall goal, every jazz artist's goal is to somehow give the music more exposure, uh, to expose particularly younger people who are sort of besieged with, with pop culture and, and pop images all the time. You know, even if they don't really follow it, you don't really have much of a choice because it's just in your face all the time, you know? So our job is, is to boost the music. So with that being said, uh, we have kids from all means, uh, all races. Uh, I, actually, what I'm most proud of with Jazz House Kids, uh, what has turned out to be our flagship program it's a program called Chica Power. And uh, it is strictly for young girls to come and learn the art of jazz, uh, the art of listening to jazz, but particularly to, to play jazz. Because uh, at some point we realized that there was just so many boys in, the, in our program. And uh, we all sort of collectively looked and said, you know, where are the young ladies, you know? And uh, so my wife went out and actually did like, she basically did like her own poll. You know, she kind of did like her own research and she went to these high schools and talked to these young ladies and said, you know, uh, do you like jazz? Don't you like jazz? If so, why? If not, why not? And um, some of the answers that she got were quite uh, interesting, things that we weren't prepared for. Uh, I think the one that moved Melissa the most is when this young lady says, well, um, and she said this was not good or bad. It was just an observation. She says, in general, boys seem to have more confidence. They don't mind failing in front of other boys. You know, Uh, uh, know, boys get embarrassed just like anybody else, but they recover much quicker, you know, Uh, whereas uh, I feel like if I go into this jazz group, and I'm not sounding good, not only am I too embarrassed to fail in front of the boys, but I feel like my fellow girls are going to look at me like you failed all of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and that, was, uh, that was really deep. To and how that. old, roughly? This, this, this girl was maybe 12 or 13. Exactly. You know? And um, so Melissa said, well, let's create a program where all you young ladies can just be among yourselves and you do what you need to do in front of each other. You will support each other. And the best part of it all is almost all of our boys have said, ladies, where you been? We, we need it. We need you here. You know? So uh, it's really great to see how uh, uh, these, these young ladies have come into the program and really have, uh, uh, embraced it and, and, and they're building their confidence through this music. Yes, I love that. And, you know, one of the themes of the Rebooted podcast, where we really invite you to kind of, you know, get back and get reconnected to your own roots, your own tethering in the earth, of the earth, that you're from that, but also to yourself, right? Yes. That you can right. grow strong, have that nice strong trunk, and then you grow out with the branches and the leaves, and then there's the fruit, and that nourishes other there things. You go. That's right. And all those little roots are talking to each other underground and all that kind of stuff, and, and how all that's sort of working, um, not obviously necessarily, right. but that it's happening. Exactly. Right? That's right. And, and to that, to that point, um, Carol Gilligan, uh, I interviewed uh, recently, and I'm not sure what order these are going to air in these shows, but she just wrote a book uh, about patriarchy. And she, you know, is a professor at NYU and talks a lot about just at that age, you're talking about how women lose, girls lose their voice. Um, right. because of the socialization and that it's a consequence of patriarchy overall and that boys tend to lose their sort of heart connection um, and that it's, it's maybe a little bit younger with what that you know, happens in, in boys, but that really you are just doing exactly what is needed in order to kind of allow young women to come into their own power and not in an aggressive way. Exactly, right. <laughs> And creative and collaborative way. That's and right. That's right. Boats. There you go. 
because because we we thought that you know when we come up when we came up with this idea of of chica power the idea was not to sort of have like you know a separatist movement so to speak you know we're going to have like an all female band uh uh only jazz history for girls the the overall goal was to somehow bring everybody together and I mean, you know, the, the boys in our program, you know, we're talking between ages eight and 18. And there's just some things that boys just don't think about, you know. And I think that when they saw, I think a lot of the, the girls thought that the boys wouldn't be welcomed, you know, kind of like, uh, oh, man, you know, what's this going to be? You know, now, now we're going to have to, you know, change the music. And, and none, none of that ever happened. The, the boys were so excited to see young young girls playing the bass, young girls playing the trumpet, young girls playing the trombone, these instruments that are not traditionally associated with, with young young women. And uh, the boys are really, really excited. And so uh, that's really raised all ships. Mm -hmm. I, I love that because it invites um, collaboration as opposed to competition. Right. And there that- There you go, right. You know, and that's a consequence of the competition piece of patriarchy more so than it is um, of how we sort of naturally unfold to be, as you said, when we are transferring into this other place, this other place being kind of more the natural state of how we are when we don't have this hierarchical thing that's kind of put upon right. us structurally. Right, right. Where we have identities, roles to fill. This is what it means to be a boy. This is what it means to be a girl. Right, right, right. I'm very proud of, uh, of, of my wife and, and just the, the program in general. And I think of more, obviously we're going through a, a very transformational period in American culture right now that uh, has been needed. It's been bubbling and boiling under the surface for quite some time. Um, I, I don't think it has resolved itself yet. I think it will probably be a long time before it does. I think there's still like some, uh, uh, I, I think there is sort of some uh, natural human qualities that will always just sort of take over first, you know, whatever that is, you know. Uh, so I, I, we're in a re, we're, the landscape seems to be changing and more people are thinking about things that they've never thought of before. And it's really healthy. It's really important. Uh, but we're still in the middle of it. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how it kind of balances out or, or resolves itself if it does. Right. Right. Well, again, a lot of times people say we're on a spiral. So it, it spirals towards and out. Right. So it's yes. forever. We're not just necessarily stuck in this one place, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a slow groove out. But uh, but like a sound wave. Right. It's kind of expanding. I mean, we just saw those beautiful pictures of the black hole uh, that yes. a young woman was uh, essentially responsible for 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 capturing. Yes. So, so let's go back to this piece about 1959 and kind of what you just said about, um, sort of not said about the political climate that we're in right now. Uh, yeah. What was happening in 1959 that created such amazing jazz? Why was that so important for um, the culture, the people? What did it mean to uh, certain communities? Uh, and, yeah. and what can we learn from that and apply to uh, where we are now beyond things like Jazz House Kids that you're doing? It's very interesting. I think a lot of people have uh, written, uh, discussed, you know, there, there's been books about it. And uh, there's been a lot of different theories and, and, and ideas as to why lightning struck like that in 1959. Uh, I really do think it was sort of just this cosmic thing that happened. I mean, if, if you want to whittle it down to real specifics, kind of like what was going on socially and, and politically and uh, and frankly, just musically. 1959 saw, um, you look at rock and roll, uh, rhythm and blues, which, which had not yet become soul music. Uh, you think of where jazz was at that time. You think of where the civil rights movement was at that time, which actually was really in its very early stages. Uh, there was sort of this crossroads between 
um, the church, the secular world, jazz musicians, blues musicians, they all were in the same place at the same time. So it wasn't a far stretch to, you know, like the, the stretch between Ray Charles and somebody like Miles Davis was, was very, very small, uh, particularly in the, in the community, in, in, in the black communities and in the whole music community. I would say by like 1965, 1966, they started to separate because soul music became its own thing, its own genre, had its own fans, and jazz started to kind of go this way, it became a little more esoteric, uh, a little more artist-driven because, you know, we, we never sold any records, right? <laughs> but <laughs> I think in 1959, everything was all there at the same time trying to figure it out together. Um, the, the, the civil rights era was just beginning. Uh, the the uh, bus boycott had happened four years before. Uh, Martin Luther King was really starting to get some uh, head of steam going. Uh, the Nation of Islam was starting to get a head of steam going in New York. Um, the uh, Elvis, Elvis Presley was in the army, I think, Buddy Holly had died already. So like rock and roll was sort of in the, the Rolling Stones had not yet come to America. So rock and roll was sort of in this traumatic limbo because like its biggest star was in the army and many of his other biggest stars were, they had passed away. Little Richard had decided to become preacher. So he was off the scene. So rock and roll was in this limbo and sort of the more sophisticated, elegant people who were uh, appreciating the arts tended to turn to jazz, you know, because uh, it was still very much a, a people music, if you will. Uh, it hadn't yet gotten too, too esoteric because when, when you talk to people about why did jazz sort of lose its, you know, uh, why did jazz fall out of favor with popular culture? Most people will say it got too esoteric, it got too weird, it, it, you know, just, uh, it just got, it got too heady, you know. Whereas I think in 1959, all of these things were still kind of close together, you know. Um, and these social movements that really started to ramp up in the 60s, um, the music changed with it. Like I said, soul music became its own thing. Uh, the British invasion came in 1964. Um, Malcolm X, of course, was, was murdered in 1965. King was murdered in 1968. So in 1959, you have like the roots of this movement that's about to come. Mm. And uh, I think it was just, it's just a very exciting time. And just all of these things just kind of hit right at the same time. This, the, these, the, you know, these roots, you said, like you, you were talking about the roots talking to each other. You right, know? right. That's what was happening in 1959. Right. I love that. Um, and, and I love the alchemy of that. And, and, uh, I, and to be honest, uh, I don't know, about 20 years ago, I remember going to see Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock with my mom and a girlfriend from college. And it was some far out fusion stuff. And I know what right. you, it was like, <laughs> they were like, what is this? You know, you didn't get it. And I mean, I had studied fake book and stuff and piano when I was right. there, and right. I knew it a little bit, but it was kind of like, yeah, I know it's uh, so to your point about whether or not jazz got a little trippy. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, you know, this part where the roots were kind of coming together with the social part. I, I feel you on that. Um, I saw, uh, I, I saw that same tour. Uh, I saw Wayne and Herbie. I, I can't remember where I saw them. So some on the road somewhere. And, uh, yeah, they really did push the listeners about as far as they could go. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, at the end of the concert, we heard Wayne and Herbie talking among themselves and, uh, I couldn't believe it. it, it this actually was sort of an eye opener. Wayne looked at Herbie and he says, uh, I don't know, I don't think it was really clicking tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Herbie said, uh, yeah, it probably wasn't 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 the best performance tonight, but you know, we'll get them tomorrow, right? And so I just remember thinking, like, okay, so they actually agreed that uh, 
tonight might have been a little too trippy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad to know that number one, they're aware of it. Number two, they were actually okay with it. You know, kind of like, well, hey, that's that's where we were, like artistically, that's where we were sent at that time. We had to go there to find out that it wouldn't work. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But like they were okay with that. And I, I, I love that. Really I, I, I really love that too. And it is deep. And, 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 and to the point about, um, you know, spiritual practice, if you will. I mean, I think this is really kind of at that at that level like how do we know what our growing edges are we may right. not all have an audience of hundreds of people to be our guinea pig so to speak but <laughs> right, you know, right. i mean the alchemy of what happens in a live auditorium is is what you do as a musician as a right musician. that's right so it doesn't it's really no different if you're sitting on your cushion you know uh for several hours or something in some state <laughs> or 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 just doing whatever it is that you do for your practice whatever that yes means. um but that but that this was sort of like, well, going to that growing edge, right? Yeah. And, and that all of their practice, all of their discipline, all of their knowledge of precision and of this is what we could do if we wanted to, quote unquote, make it sound nice or right. be appealing to the audience if yes. we were trying to package it in such a fashion. But that that performance was not that. It that. was about exploring and staying curious which is the foundation of what we're talking about i think in spiritual practice about letting go and being open to see what comes and being in the moment right that's it you you pretty much nailed what all improvisers strive to do all jazz improvisers improvisers strive to do that tell me more I don't know if I could say it any better than you did, but you know, I, I think that uh, for me, speaking of Wayne Shorter again, uh, Wayne Shorter, actually both Wayne and Herbie, uh, uh, they've been practicing uh, Nishirin Buddhism for uh, probably 40, uh, 45 years now. And as, as human beings, uh, Wayne and Herbie happen to be probably two of the most inspirational, uh, some of the kindest people you've ever wanted to meet in your whole life. And um, when I think of their music, separately, not not as a team, but like the music that Wayne Shorter created with his groups through the years and the music that Herbie Hancock has created with his groups through the years, they're vastly different, you know? Um, uh, whereas Herbie is much more, uh, Herbie's really off the cuff. You know, Herbie will play almost with anyone doing anything. You know, I'm, I'm game to try whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, whereas Wayne is the same, but Wayne's compositions are so impeccably thought out and so geniusly crafted, you know what I mean? I, I really think he's sort of our living Beethoven or, or, or Bach. You know, uh, but when you speak with him, um, he almost never, ever, ever makes any musical references. He always makes spiritual references or cosmic references, or uh, I think his background as a visual artist also kind of uh, helped his shape his concept as a musician. So he also make uh, visual art uh, references in his music. And sometimes you just need Wayne to tell you what the note is. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, dude, is it B flat or is it B natural? You know, is the chord C9 or C3? Come on, what is it? He's like, uh, yeah, it's more like, uh, it's more like Jupiter at 5 a.m., you know? <laughs> and he's like, dude, come on, man, ain't helping me. <laughs> so... Well, uh, but then at some point you put all of this together and it really makes perfect sense. There's another story about Wayne. Uh, some guy, well, I don't know if this is a true story, but it's, uh, I saw this in the book uh, when Weather Report was together. Um, somebody made the casual, everyday question of, uh, say, Wayne, what time is it? And Wayne <laughs> replied, well, it's relative. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. And so one of the other band members was like, hey, it's, it's quarter to four, bro. <laughs> right, right, right. They stepped in. They looked at their watch and they stepped in. That's right. Oh. So Wayne's sense of the big spiritual creative picture when you're improvising as a musician, uh, even though I don't think I, nor anyone I know, could ever be that deep or that spiritually in tune with whatever you may call it, Buddha, God, Jehovah, Allah, whatever you call them, just this, this energy, the spirit that's much bigger than, than the human spirit, um, that's what we need to be trying to get in touch with as, uh, as musicians, as artists, as everyday people. And I find that uh, to dial it all the way back to what we were talking about, I think somehow confidence is directly tuned in with your faith. You know, I think that uh, I've always, like I, I've never thought of myself as a, as a religious person. My, you know, my, my family, uh, we grew up as Christians. You know, we, we went, my, my great, great, let me see, my, yeah, my great, great grandmother, was the founder of the church that we grew up in, in Philadelphia, um, St. Paul Church. And, but my mother, you know, very modern day hip new school woman, uh, she says, listen, you carry your spirituality with you, not just on Sunday morning, you know. Um, you don't necessarily have to go to church to be in tune with God, you know. She mm. says, so many of them people, and she, she said, I'm not trying to talk bad about them, but there are a lot of hypocrites in that place, you know. Mm. Um, she says, I, I'm going to, you know, she's, I want you to be in tune with the spirit seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. You don't necessarily have to go to church for that, you know. Beautiful. And so um, I somehow, I, 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 I always tend to relinquish myself to whatever greater power that that's, that's why I try not to, I mean, people always say, Oh man, you never get nervous. You know, it looks like you never get scared. You never get angry. None of that is true. I, I'm a human being. We all have emotions. Right. Uh, but I tend to think that um, there's a greater force that will always lead you to where you need to get to as long as you let it. And you're a good person and you think positive and you work hard, you still got to put in the work to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I find that not a lot of people are really sort of, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I have a feeling that people are confusing spirituality, faith, religion. They kind of all lump it together and we sort of have like this anti spiritual community where people believe in, well, I guess it's always been like this. They believe in money. They believe in power. Uh, these days they believe in Instagram followers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I don't know. I think there's, there's a real, there's a real joy. There's a real sort of relief to have a strong faith, you know, and uh, to, 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 link that with how Wayne Shorter speaks and how he composes. Uh, I hope I could get to some version of that. One well, day. I, th I think after six Grammys, we know you did get to some version of that. We're not, you know, you're not in the replicating Petri dish perhaps of Wayne as no one should be, right? But, um, you know, we're, I, I would just certainly say you have that. And, and anyone who has had, and you know, I'm a poet, right? And so anybody who has had this like creative impulse to just I got your books. I was gonna find. I was gonna find them, Joyce, so I can embarrass you. <laughs> make you blush on camera, but I did some moving around down here. I don't. All my books are all out of whack. That's okay. <laughs> You're funny. Thank you. Um, hopefully, I'll have a new publisher someday, and I can get another one out there. Um, but I just won a prize, actually, and I'll disclose this in the spirit of being improvisational, right? Um, and sort of whatever it is that wants to come out or come forward being the thing that's kind of the real gold with the, um, 
you know, your inner something, right? Whatever it yes. is that's wanting to move forward. Um, I just want to prize for a poem that I wrote when I got back from uh, an encounter with someone that I just kind of wrote it. It wasn't uh, something that I had thought about. I didn't, you know, go to school and, you know, study these different ways of iambic pentameter and lyrical poetry and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sorry. I just, uh, that's okay. Um, it was more a organic process, which is what you're talking about. And yeah. allowing that organic process to unfold by picking up a pen, or in my case, putting, you know, sitting down at my computer after I had had this encounter and this experience with someone and then putting it down on paper. And then, you know, yes, of course, I did the work, quote unquote, of sending it in. But it's not the poems that I fuss over that seem to make any bigger of a difference you know <laughs> uh, it's not it's not those aren't the ones that really uh sing to your heart yeah you know? yeah 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 uh you know they, they can be okay but uh they're not the ones that that kind of hit the nerve um when i recorded my first album called getting to it i wrote these two songs and in my brain i'm thinking okay these are the songs that the people are going to like these are going to be like you know the hits, you know, I know that doesn't exist in jazz, but the song that everyone seemed to like was the song that I just, you know, like, it was going to be like my, you know, my jazz tune, like the, the tune that only the musicians would like. Mm -hmm. And uh, that song was the song that sort of came the easiest. Um, I remember thinking about only the song. Whether, I didn't really think about whether people were going to like it or not, or if it was going to be the hit. And that sort of became the one that everybody liked. So uh, I think when you wrote your poem after that, you know, you, you said you had an encounter and you just came and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and wrote it. I mean, I deeply admire yours and, and, and every writer or poet, composer, their, their, their prolificness, you know. Um, because, listen, I, I got... Both your books, I remember the night you came down to the Vanguard to hear my band, <laughs> and we were hanging late after the gig, and all these people were all hanging out at the bar, having a good time, <laughs> and you dropped some poetry right there in the middle of the club. <laughs> and I, I was like, man, how does she, does she write this often? That's, that's admirable. <laughs> Thank you, you're funny. I don't know, well, I think that, you know, I mean, back to this thing that's emergent, right? Like um, my mindfulness teacher, Jack Cornfield, who is, uh, you know, sort of my, my main mentor, he talks about, uh, he tells a story oftentimes at, at retreats and stuff about how there's a, uh, you know, a kid that wasn't doing all so well in school. And, and the teacher had said to him, like, you know, but what is your gift? What are you, sp you know, and he was like, I don't have a gift. And, and then um, he thought about it later when he had bumped into someone and he came back to the teacher and said uh, that my gift is in, in catching fish to give to my family, to give to my community. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's my gift. He was like, I really, I'm really good at that. And I really, um, I, I bring dinner home. And that's, wow. you know, a valuable contribution, right? That's an incredibly but, valuable. And in this society, we tend to want to have everybody be perhaps sort of cut from the same cloth, you, you know, in terms of whether it's Wall Street you, or... You, you bring up something that uh, a few of us had a discussion about probably 12 hours ago as we were leaving the, the, the gala event. There's this um, one student who has been with us for quite some time, and they're in college now. And one of their college professors came up to us and said, hey, we'd like to speak with you about student X. And uh, student X is really, the, 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 the quote was, they are just so painfully shy. Like they don't talk, they don't try to go after these opportunities that, that we're giving them. And, we just, we just need to see if there's anything wrong and, you know, like kind of what's the deal. And uh, at first there was a little bit of, you know, we, we kind of all stood and kind of looked at each other and said, huh, yeah, maybe. Oh, but wait a second. We thought, what's wrong with being shy? You know, yeah. uh, if this person doesn't like to speak, if this person 
isn't sort of, uh, uh, you know, like you said, we all, everybody wants to be cut from the same, you know, everybody has to be a go-getter. You know, everybody has to be chasing success. Everybody has to be, uh, you know, or, or, excuse me, but you know, everybody has to be badass, right? Mm. And like, that's not true. You know, it's okay if you're shy. It's okay if you want to hang back. It's okay if you're not chasing uh, what is perceived as success. You know, it's, nothing's wrong with that. I was like, hey, are they passing the test? Yeah, they're passing the test. Are they good in good grades? Yeah, they're good in good grades. Do they sound good? Yeah, they sound great. Well, what's the problem? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right, right. You know? yeah, what's authentic for you? <clears throat> and, That's and- right each just be our own uniqueness and have that unfold and then just see how it changes as all things do also, or as it evolves, I should say, not so much changes per se. And and, and another thing was this, the students probably 20 years old, you know, it's like, how formed are we as people at age 20? Right. Well, a lot of the, um, you know, folks that study these things um, say is around 25, 27 is when things kind of slow down, you know, with Uh the brain. And that as mammals, we come out of the womb, we only have um, a small portion of our brain developed. That's probably, so that. probably earlier with men. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have uh, neuroplasticity options, right? So that we I did get them. really stupid once I got to high school. I used to be so smart. <laughs> what happened in high school that changed? Girls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a distraction, right? So in, in- real stupid. Yeah. Uh, well, but again, then to go back to like the psychological aspect of it, it would be what need was that serving, right? Like, like what about that? How was that helpful? Meaning, was it, you know, because it made you feel more important? Is it because you had a desire for connection as all humans do as mammals? Is it because? Well, me specifically, I, I can actually tell you a very concrete reason why, because uh, growing up, as a kid, most I would hear most of these boys talk about their conquest at age 11 and 12, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, in retrospect, that's way too early, I believe, for any kid to be thinking in terms of sexual activity, right? It's just, it's just too young, you know? But, you know, grew up in a particular neighborhood where I guess people got started earlier, right? And so by the time I got to high school, like, I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with me? Nobody likes me. You know, people, I I used to get teased all the time. You know, I'm I'm a big nerd. I'm fat. I'm a dork. I got big teeth. You like jazz. Yo, please. Oh, boy, get out of here. You know? (laughs) And then, like, overnight, I mean, literally overnight, I went from being this fat, big tooth dork who likes jazz to like, you know, all of a sudden I got skinny, I grew, I, I grew into my face, and literally overnight it went from zero to 10. Like all these girls started liking me, and I went, wow, I'm cool now, you know? Mm. And uh, I just didn't know how to handle that, uh, that, that transition, you know? Mm. To know that people actually liked me now, that was, uh, I guess, I, I, maybe, it was a, maybe it was a feeling of, let me enjoy all of this before it turns back. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> you know? Well, you bring up an interesting point because that's one of the mindfulness teachings too, right? Is enjoy the goodness that's here when it's here. Enjoy the joy that's here, right? So that there's no real problem with enjoying what's present if people right. are enjoying your company and wanting to spend time with you. But that it's the craving, it's the sort of greed, the lust, right, the obsession right. with only ever sort of focusing on that That. as um, the root of uh, dissatisfaction, right? So that if we end up always just having that be their only thing, then our our view gets so narrow that we don't, we we, we miss the next miracle when the other thing happens down the line. Yes. Or we get locked into fearing that we're going to lose it, as you just said, which then puts us into aversion, which I fear the other right? Which again, takes us away from what actually is, which could be a mix of, okay, so I'm more popular now, but some days I'm going to be, you know, the girls may still not call me. And that doesn't mean that my own inner dignity and worth is completely out the window because of what your grandmother said. You still have that 
inborn in you soul force, whatever it is that yes. isn't going anywhere or necessarily connected to the external events in the world. Preach, teach. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to come see you once a week. <laughs> <laughs> I do Zoom sessions. I do Skype sessions. <laughs> oh. No, I need, to come, like, I need to come sit on that couch for, for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's okay, too. You know, that's okay, too. Um, I, oh, no, no, I won't ask you that on camera. I was going to say, can I bring my flask and vodka? <laughs> <laughs> you're funny well you know it's funny though because i haven't drank in since the time that i you know was in the uh village vanguard uh you know i i haven't had any alcohol in the last I, what what happened that night <laughs> well no no i mean like that period right like so oh okay like, four, like I was four, say, years ago did something or... traumatic happened at the vanguard <laughs> i didn't know about <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, no. It's, I guess all I'm trying to say is, is I don't know if I would be so able to spit poetry out of uh, anywhere because, you know, that uh, 2 a.m. social lubricant, you know, uh, has a little bit of um, <laughs> a little influence, to, right? Well, I have to say, you know, at a certain point, because, because why? It, it, don't. Me, it was killing. Well, thank you. It takes away the inhibitions, right? So that's the whole point is if you're right. not inhibited, if you're not fearful, if the anxiety isn't there, then yeah. you're just free to flow. I mean, that's what they call it when you're rapping, right. when you're spitting, when you're po you know, when right. you're, when right. you're improvis imp imp improvising. Yeah. Um, but I don't need the, the booze to do it anymore. I'm just saying that I know that sometimes there are times when I was uh, a little more inclined to perhaps sure. to go like that. I hear you because of because of that and now i don't need that anymore. well good for you good for you thank you yeah it's interesting right but you know why is because um as i continued to sort of study what they call the precepts no killing no harming right speech you know uh wise <clears throat> excuse me wise sexual relations <clears throat> excuse me and those kinds of things no intoxicants um, it just became clear that these were the things that you could do structurally to kind of enhance the framework of your life to not create further issues. Yeah. But you could then like sort of start from a cleaner slate for me. Like, you know, it's not one more thing I got to worry about. Yeah. And, and yeah, for, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So if I'm not telling lies, then I don't have to worry about that. If I don't have, no. if I'm not killing things, then I don't have to worry about feeling bad about that. If I'm not, uh, you know, engaging in relationships or relations that are mm, potentially problematic, then I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about that, right, right. So it's just, it's been a useful framework. Um, and everybody can do it their own way. And, that, and that's, that's not only very spiritual thinking, that's quite practical thinking as <laughs> well. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this body isn't getting any younger. <laughs> and uh, you know, you gotta you gotta take what's here. Take care of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I messed around for a long time. Um, so okay, we're having a good time. Let's talk a little bit about what kind of you were saying earlier um, about kids, Instagram, social stuff. Um, frankly, you know, a lot of the podcasts that I'll be doing uh, over the next period of time have to do with implicit bias, uh, racism. Um, white supremacy, patriarchy, all these sort of social things. And right. uh, one of the Dharma teachers, Ruth King, that I interviewed last year, she talks a lot about how the creative arts really can um, really help, uh, especially communities of color, to just nurture and reclaim uh, uniqueness and resilience and uh, ways in which we can get back in touch with, frankly, I think a lot of the that is missing in other cultures that could be very beneficial if tapped back into. I'm losing you a little bit on the uh, sound. Okay, better. Go ahead. Really? Oh, okay. I wonder what happened. Anyhow, I was saying that uh, I just got back from Japan. All right, welcome back. We had a couple of technical difficulties. Please continue, Mr. McBride. We got it all scraped. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I just got back from Japan and uh, most musicians really like going to Japan. And uh, 
sometimes for what could be deemed as selfish reasons, you know, because um, we feel that Japanese culture, which is a very old culture, um, they really understand the value of creativity and art. Uh, so particularly when people who are viewed as geniuses at creative expression, they will, they will treat you like a, a king or a queen, you know? So you go to Japan, I won't go as far as to say they worship you, but they, they give you your proper respect. They understand that what you do as an artist is very special, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the culture around th that, that surrounds that, it's interesting that they don't, they don't appreciate you because you have sexy, glossy photos, that you have 100,000 Instagram followers, that you've sold 500,000 records or a million records, or that you're dating some celebrity, that you're on the cover of some magazine, they literally don't care about that. What they care about is that that the the art that you create is on a high level, you know. And I and I I really get that uh, there are many cultures, uh, particularly older cultures, uh, they can sort of get under the fray. I I, I think. Um, or, or, or above the fray, I, I think. In, I, I think American culture has been. Um, we we care too much about the gift wrap and not what's inside the box. Mm. You know, uh, as long as the wrap looks sweet and there's this nice little sexy silk bow, who cares if you know there's garbage <laughs> inside of the box? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think social media, um, social media itself is not the issue. It's how we handle it, you know, um, and what we have allowed to do that to us. Um, I certainly think social media has done some wonderful things. Um, but I also believe that America, which is already somewhat of a cynical nation, uh, I think has made it worse. I think there are a lot of people who have. Hello, are you still there? Oh yeah. What was that? I can hear you. You're good. Oh, that was weird. I'm sorry. I don't messed up my flow. <laughs> That's all right. Um, uh, I find it interesting that, um, I, I think there's a lot of people using social media to 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 prey on the fears and the anger of uh, people who follow it. And in order to counter that anger and that fear, um, we've almost gotten into more of a, um, uh, to, to, to kind of shield ourselves from that, we've, we've become even more of a, less less spiritual community mm -hmm. a less faith based or less faith driven community and when i say that i'm not talking about uh church or god or whatever you call it but like um it's almost like uh i don't see a lot of uplifting anymore i see a lot of uh uh combat a lot of verbal combat a lot of out angering other people you know, and I'm thinking like, hey, what happened to the love? Nobody's sending, nobody's spreading any love anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I find a lot of these ancient cultures, uh, yeah, they have their issues too. Every, every, every culture has some issue that if you go deep down inside, it's troublesome, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think, there's no such thing as a, a, a there's no such thing as utopia. Not not in not in a culture of human beings. It just isn't. You're not going to find that. You know, um, 
Now you can have that within yourself uh, yeah. on occasion. Um, but what you can't have in yourself, you surely are not going to find in the culture of, of, of human beings. It just doesn't exist, you know? Um, so I, I wish that uh, we could live in a culture that wasn't constantly trying to out anger each other. Uh, I mean, I'm the, it was, there's a, a famous Martin Luther King quote, uh, some hate does not drive out hate. Only love can do that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And we're not loving anymore. We just, you know, putting out fires with fires. Right. Well, what's interesting that about that is, is that if we talk about mindfulness and teachings, ancient wisdom teachings, and we talk about how we're connected and how we're interdependent and how, um, you know, things are really more processed and less fixed, kind of to Wayne Shorter's point about like, well, it kind of, B flat, it's kind of like Jupiter at 5 a.m. Like, yeah, right, not right. So much naming the thing, but we're trying to, you know, what, what's the gist of it, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. If you follow, if you're a psychologist, you follow Eugene Gendlin's focusing. It's like the philosophy of the implicit. They would call it the felt sense. And that's sort of what you're talking about when you're feeling it, when you're feeling the flow, right? When you're doing yes. your flow. And that the culture of patriarchy is one that's founded on separation, separating men's and young boys' hearts from their whole self and girls' voices from their whole self, to your point right. earlier. And even Charles Blow, um, who writes for the New York Times, uh, you know, Brent Staples writes for the New York Times, um, both uh, black men, um, Staples got a Pulitzer, and, and Charles Blow just really did this little video. Did you see it on Twitter? No, I haven't seen it. Well, he was just basically saying, like, don't come at me for saying, why am I supposed to be in competition with this man who is brilliant that I right. go to as my mentor for my, uh, you know, for, for, for when I have questions and, and uh, you know, let's be happy for Brent for getting a Pulitzer for doing all this amazing work on journalism wow. about racism in this country and around the world and how it's problematic and is rewarded for it. Let us clap for him, not clap back at this there issue you know. of us fighting against one another. And that philosophy of um, you or me, as opposed to you and me necessarily right? The, the whole point of the Buddhist teachings is wrong view, which is delusional view, which right. is me assuming or thinking that I'm separate in the first place, which is the fodder for then me being able to compete against you or see you as different or want to eat you up or crush you down or have power over you. That right. all of that is just a fabrication. It's not really how things really are. So when we're inviting people to drop back into that place that you say it's within you, yeah. And of course, it can be out there. It's because we've forgotten that it's in there, right? Or not cultivated it, which is part of the practice of sadhana. Yes, exactly, right. Any kind of practice, including your music, musical practices, spiritual practice. And that that can remind us. It's the remembering, the returning back to what's already there so that we can connect with one another from that place, not from this egocentric Instagram place. Oh, man. Oh, you. You're so eloquent. <laughs> I can't like, play the beat. Such a beautiful way to, to to put it all in in perspective. Well, I mean, I think that you know what you're doing is a different level of practice. Do you yes. know what I mean? You do. I mean, talk about the Newport Jazz Festival. Talk about your podcast. Talk about all the stuff that you're doing up at Lincoln Center. You know, for those who are in New York or want to come. I mean, we know you travel all around the world, and you just mentioned being in Japan and how their framework is a different framework. Much different, yeah. Uh, much different framework in Asia. Much different framework in in Europe. Uh, much different framework in South America. Uh, I, I, it's just interesting how artists. Uh, are treated uh, in other places of the world. But uh, with, with specific regards to some of the other projects that I'm doing, uh, in 2016, uh, I was named the successor to George Ween as artistic director of the 65-year-old Newport Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's been... I, to consciously think of uh, sort of being at the artistic helm 
of such a legacy uh, it, it's, it's deep to think about it, you know? So uh, this will be my, my third year as artistic director. And uh, we just uh, made the final announcement of all of the artists uh, just about a week, about a week and a half ago. And uh, thinking about what George Ween sort of put into place with the Newport Jazz Festival, every style of jazz has always been represented at that festival throughout the years, which at first uh, was just a two day festival. Um, just one, one stage for two days, which has now turned into four stages over three days. So we have uh, 65 artists that we present at the festival every year. And uh, tell you where my faith has really had to kick in is when that, when, when I was designated as the type, when it was made official that I would be an artistic director, um, <laughs> I now got a swarm of CDs and 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 resumes in the mail, like yo, you gonna hook me up in Newport, right? And I was like, wow, I I kind of knew this was coming, but wow, there's a tidal wave. This is deep, right? <laughs> and uh, because I'm a musician, right? I'm a musician. I would say three quarters of of these resumes and CDs I would would get would be from people I know already, mm. you know. And so uh, it overnight became like very difficult to now have to say, look, I can't put you on the festival this year, you know? So, uh, but I realized that the festival is, well, the jazz community at large is the bigger picture, you know? Uh, me, my, me personally is not significant. Uh, what is significant is how the jazz community uh, benefits from the oldest jazz festival in America, you know? So uh, I, I really try to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. That really helps me get through any angst of having to tell a musician, it's like, no, no, bro, I ain't gonna book you this year. <laughs> well, but you know, you bring up an interesting point, Christian, because again, one of the key teachings is equanimity or balance and, and discernment. And discernment is boundaries, really, healthy boundaries, you know, in the sense of saying like, hey, you know, um, you know, I think the, the terminology in Tibetan Buddhism is, is sort of idiot compassion. I don't know, the translations are a little wonky. Idiot right? compassion? Idiot compassion as opposed to, you know, like, deep just general real love compassion right and, right, and this right. idea of like don't try to be nice just to be nice and then end up with more trouble like sometimes it's okay to say no or it's right. appropriate to say no or right. there's a reason to say no and that that's okay right yeah. and yeah. no now doesn't mean no never it just means right no now at this right. time right and it's not you know ruth king says nothing's permanent perfect or personal so like let it go it's not a big deal uh, give me that one more time. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I need to use that. You. No, nothing's perfect. This is Ruth King. She, again, quoting her, she's a Dharma teacher. Nothing's perfect, permanent, or personal. She's rephrasing the Buddhist teachings to make them current. Got it. I need to hit you up after we're done here. I need, I need buy, you need to turn me on to some books. I will. <laughs> I will, I will. Well, Dropping all kinds of knowledge on me. Oh, come on. It's inside though, isn't it? Don't you already know it? Don't you think when you see something or feel something or hear something that feels true, it's already inside you, but it's just kind of like... Absolutely. Very much so. I, I feel very, very lucky that... Uh, I think most, most musicians feel like this. Um, the happiest and probably the most at peace I ever feel is when I'm holding my bass, is when I'm playing my bass. Um, I really feel like some sort of a, like a visceral connection to that, you know? It's like the, 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 like I'm, I'm holding my bass, I'm playing the bass, 
the universe is like, okay, you cool now. I got you. Don't worry, you just play. You know? I'm yeah, you're cool now. I got you. You yeah. just play. Yeah. Now wouldn't that be nice if we could just live our lives that way, even if we're not Hello as a basis. You're yeah. cool. I got you. Yeah. Just play. Yeah. Yeah. Just be. And because of that, um, you know, people always, I've, I found it strange that people would often say, Christian, you look so happy when you play. You know, you always smile when you play. My thought is, well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> I never understood why that was like, why that always got special mention because I thought that as a musician, where would you be more happy that than at your instrument? Mm. You know? um, but yeah, I just feel some real, some real joy when I have my instrument in my hand and uh, and when I'm creating. I mean, I I feel like it's the same way with you when you when you write your poetry. Um, uh, I feel like when you do your, re I mean, like I I started practicing Buddhism officially. I think I don't know if I told you that. About, about, a, about a year ago, or mm -hmm. maybe just over a year ago now. Yeah, we had just talked the first time. Yeah, and uh, the research that I'm doing, you know, I feel like every time I discover new information, it's just like, I get a jolt, like, oh, this is great, check this out, you know. Um, I sent Herbie this, this email, I said, Herbie, I just wanted to let you know, I joined SGI officially, um, you know, just wanted to let you know I'm 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 in the club, and and Herbie wrote back the nicest thing. He says, "Well, I always thought of you as a Buddhist anyway." Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, wow. He says, "You know, you 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 got that uh, you got that all inclusive, empathetic thing happening." Right, you know? right, yeah. Or another way of saying it that sometimes people say is, "None of us are Buddhists. We are all Buddhas." Right. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> don't don't be a Buddhist. Be a Buddha. Right, 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 right. You know, a Buddha. Right, Buddha meaning the bud that that which is unflowering, that which is opening, that which is expanding, that which yeah. is receiving. I have a I have a question for you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> as we wind down, here we go. Well, because uh, I, I believe I asked you this before, but the, there's a certain thing that um, people like, you know, again, to bring up somebody like Wayne or, or Herbie or, or people who really just seem so nicely balanced, you know, uh, dealing with, and, and this is right up your area. You just start dealing with trauma or anger or any sort of 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 uh pain like inner pain like uh do you personally like how do you how do you balance that out because we're all human beings and we we all have emotions right we all get angry we all get sad we all get whatever but uh how do you not let that overtake you well, now I have better tools. Now I understand my physiology a little bit better, but I said, we all get caught. I got caught yesterday snapping at somebody because they didn't, in my opinion, do what they said they were going to do when they said they were going to do it in the way that I had thought that they would. And, you know, all of that expectations lead to what? Problems, right? right. So right. if I didn't have any expectations around it, then, you know, but at the other time, you know, on the other hand of it, like, I was like, no, I, this is like a professional thing you're supposed to do. So I was sure. correct, to, to correct to have a, 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 a response, right? But the reactive part is how far are you going to go? And, and are you doing it with intention to hurt somebody or not? So the answer I found is two things. One is understanding my physiology and my nervous system from a intellectual left brain perspective in terms of what's really going on with the neurons that fire together, the wire together, what happens when we get triggered, when we feel like we're betrayed, when we feel like we're being shamed, when we feel like whatever it is that's old, you know, gunk that's, you know, somebody hit that note 
you know what I mean? Um, uh, knowing what is happening that like, <laughs> you know, when you get the sort of brainstem amygdala reactivity, uh, your prefrontal cortex goes offline. So you cannot respond. I'm not hip to none of that. <laughs> yeah. So no, that's no, no, no. So you lo- so you know that, right? And then right. You practice this part of self-regulation. You put your feet on the floor. You let them connect to the ground. You feel the vibration of Mother Earth. You allow yourself to receive the support of the earth and you recognize that you are as much of it as you are on it. Mm. Mm. And go ahead. But it sounds like, like when you had your, you said this happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. So like how long would you say, like, was it immediate? Like after you had your moment, did you immediately step back and go, Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Like, like that. Well, I mean, I didn't go say the thing was a six. I didn't go to a 20 or an 18. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? It was a six. I went to an eight. You know what I mean? It's not bad if we no. talk in 20. <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it wasn't. And I apologize for it. And I just said, you know, we're all in this together at the end of the day. I know people are trying to do their best and I just want this to be able to work out um, for all of our benefit. And that's the practice is, you know, they call it in psychology, rupture and repair. You come back to that which is broken and you mend it just like you do that. What is it? Kisugi in the Japanese. Yes. Yes. And they repair the broken pieces. You know, you take the plate, it breaks apart. It's more valuable with the gold seems back in it like the leonard cohen sign you know where it's cracked that's where the light gets in yeah that's yeah. us so it's these pieces that then build the relationship with me and the people that i was barking at because i'm just like i'm human i'm real right i'm humble enough to be able to come back to you to sort of say like i'm bad, you know my bad yeah yes i was yeah there was a little stuff that was off here um, but you know, let's work on trying to make it better. Cause that's the win-win. That's the that's admirable. That's yeah. admirable. Most well, people will do that. It's a practice. Those, I'm not, it's not a con it's a, it's a combination. So as I was saying, feet on the floor, seat in the chair, take okay. a couple of breaths. I'm always in my seat. N- you know, 90% of the time I am in my seat these days. I don't know. Th- I don't know if I was ever in my seat mm. until a few years ago, noble and dignified sitting like the Buddha underneath the, you know, rose apple tree, able to be relaxed and alert simultaneously, not trying to be or do anything in particular. I mean, yeah, yeah, the way you feel with your base. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it happened on occasion, sort of spontaneously, but I didn't really know how to like take my seat and put myself in a place where I can be more coming from there more often than not. And that's a skill and that's a practice. And you can do that driving your car by not flipping the bird on somebody who's annoying. Right. <laughs> you don't right. have to right. do it on a meditation cushion. Yeah, I wonder what, uh, what uh, the, with specific regard to road rage, I wonder where that came from. I don't remember people being that angry, just generally speaking, bef- before. I think it's the permissiveness of unbridled self-expression, to use a Terry Real term. Mm. And that that's rewarded um, as a way of sort of uh, false power. Man, you said something there. <laughs> I'm serious. You, because I find that, I was telling somebody this the other day, I, I, I feel like um, it was, there's that old saying, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, mm-hmm. which is a way that, to me, that says you will be rewarded for being loud and abrasive. You know, um, and I find that uh, in this sort of culture where everybody's sort of like stepping over each other and being cruel at each other to in order to, you know, I don't know. What are they going for, you know, to be heard, achieve success? I I mean, I don't know what it is, but uh, I just find that uh, I've never seen um, unbridled anger at such minuscule things before you know like like road rage you know Mm -hmm. Uh, i think people wonder if they'll get like uh oh and and like you had things like youtube stars of people doing the most subjective things and thinking wow they're not 
what, what is this? <laughs> right. But a lot of that is, you know, some of that is about, I want people to like me, which is a nat natural attachment thing, right? If you're looking back at attachment theory, you're more ambivalent, perhaps attachment because you're external validation is what's really important to you. Yeah. The other one is, is I deserve to have, I'm supposed to have, right? I need to be right as opposed to be happy. There's, right. no, rigid, there's no flexibility. So you're the stiff oak that breaks in the storm as opposed to the reed that bends in the wind. You know yes. what I mean? And, and is it okay to be a reed or do you see a reed as being weak? Well, not if it survives, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a question of perspective, and we only have, just like we do with white supremacy, like blonde, thin, tall, that's the beauty standard. In right, the right. Divide. Well, I know a lot of people who don't look like that who are gorgeous, you know? Right. So right. it's just a question of whose truth are we looking at and who gets to dictate? And I think that that's what we really have to determine for ourselves. What's our truth? What's our authenticity? What do we know inside? And then... How do we manage that, deal with that, bring it forth in what ways are wise and discerning to the greater world? Yes. Francesca, I, I learn so much from you every time we speak. <laughs> Seriously. Likewise. I, I really mean that. You are, uh, you are at that level that I strive to attain. You know, you, you, you remind me very much of, uh, you know, you coming out of that Wayne and Herbie kind of thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know much about Jupiter, but I got a picture of Saturn in my house. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. Mr. McBride, inspiration that you are. I think we're going to leave it here because it seems like it's a good place to do so. And it's about time. What do you say? Yeah, you know, I, I could hang on here with you all day long, but I actually have to go prepare to go read scripts for uh, for NPR right now. Uh, doing the latest episode of uh, Jazz Night in America. Do you want to mention that real quick before we uh, close? Tell people how yeah. they tune in. Yeah, so I've been um, uh, the host of NPR's Jazz Night in America for the last uh, five years now. And uh, it airs, uh, I actually don't know when it airs in the New York area. I believe it's uh, Saturday, it's either Friday or Saturday or Saturday and Sunday uh, on WBGO here. Uh, in the New York area, 88.3. And um, we're now on almost 300 stations nationwide. Mm. And so uh, we're NPR uh, show. Uh, it's a collaboration between NPR, WBGO, and Jazz and Lincoln Center. Beautiful. I love it. So people can tune in and really enjoy the music. And I mean, you know, art, music, all these things inspire us, I think. And we just have to find our way to be our own creative and authentic selves, which you do so beautifully. And uh, people can come as, check you out. As do you, my friend. <laughs> um, you, anybody can, you can see where I am on uh, christianmcbride.com and uh, got all my tour dates for the rest of the year lined up on there. And uh, I'm always playing somewhere in either New York or in Newark. So I'm, I'm always around. You are for sure. And I'm hoping that people get out to see you in Newport too. Yes. Please get up to the Newport Jazz Festival. When uh, is that? August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Beautiful. First Christian weekend in August. Christian McBride, leaving it here. Sending you a big hug. Thank you so much for joining us on Rerooted on the Be Here Now Network. Anytime. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Ciao.